Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Kyra MSK uh, Specialist, Dr. Dustin Hendricks. Can you believe we're already on week four? Pretty crazy, right? So, we want to hear about your progress. What have you been doing to move? Have you found that you can move for three minutes? Were you able to move for three minutes multiple days? You know, comment, tell us how are you moving? What are you doing? How long? We want to hear your success stories. We want to hear how you're moving. Today we are getting into our last part of chronic pain treatment. So this is where we're going to really look at the sensitive nervous system. So we're really excited to finally get here. Okay. Um, so you know, after three weeks of talking, we've been reframing what pain is and these misconceptions and look at it. And you know, this has probably been very challenging for you. You know, you're looking for some kind of you know, well, this has got to be my issue. It's got to be my fascia. It's got to be my um, facet joints, it's got to be my disc, it's got to be my muscle, you know, it's got to be some kind of tissue, elbow, knee. So we do have what your enemy is, it's the sensitive nervous system and we're going to go into that today. You know, we've already welcomed you back on this one and you know, I just want to talk about, you know, this is probably pretty challenging and mind-blowing to think about it like this. And, you know, we just need to kind of keep moving forward and impacting this. And, you know, remember this is super important. The reason being is because till we address these misconceptions about pain and we start to move again, we won't be able to rewire the nervous system. So let's talk about this. So in the book Pain Neuroscience Education, they talk about the body having a living, breathing alarm system. You know, we call it the nervous system. You know, it's just the nerves or how your body senses things. Um, and they go into our first metaphor, which is really fascinating about it. And, you know, you can read the exact quotes where your body has a living, breathing alarm system that's always buzzing along, checking for threats. When the alarm is tripped, it ramps up, hitting a tipping point. When it fires, you know, I'll let you guys read that right there. So the interesting thing is one in four people this nervous system never calms down and these are the people who get stuck in chronic pain and we call these the yellow flags and you will look at the yellow flags um, and I'm gonna jump around a little bit but our yellow flags are actually listed down here so it can be everything from being in an auto case people who are in you know like auto cases or say like a slip and fall at work they're a lot more likely to end up in a chronic pain cycle and be disabled when you're looking at like the same injury. So what I mean by that is you have somebody who hurts their neck in you know a whiplash type situation say let's say football and then you have somebody that's in a car accident and the person in the car accident were to seek litigation from that one Bentley saying hi. The person who is going to be in the litigation would have a higher rate and they've also seen this you know with more comparable injuries so the people who have these same types of injuries in a car accident um, that ends up going to court versus the ones that don't. It's quite amazing the ones that are going to be more likely to have some kind of payment out from it. They're going to have a higher rate of disability injury. We've also seen this from what was called a, uh, it was like a tort versus, you know, um, non-claim type system. And this was in Saskatchewan. It's an interesting paper because, you know, they moved away from allowing people to get into these like legal battles for money versus accidents and stuff like that. But the rates of the disabilities from weight lashes went down significantly in that. Uh, so it's quite fascinating. So, you know, that's one instance, nature versus nurture. Uh, some cultures are more expressive of like, you know, pain and being more expressive could lead to you um, hyper focusing on it. Um, other cultures are, you know, more reserved. Um, so it's less likely for them to, you know, mention a painful experience. Thank you, sweet girl. Appreciate you. Um, fear avoidance, behavior, and reduced activities. Uh, expectation that passive rather than active treatment will be beneficial. Um, you know, this goes into our peace and love blog that we had, looking at you know movement and not icing and resting because it's actually delaying the tissue from healing properly. You know, social or financial problems, that's a big thing as well. And, you know, also, you know, people with, you know, depression, uh, low morale, social withdrawal. So these are what we call the yellow flags. And what we're starting to see, the people that have more of these yellow flags, they're more likely to get stuck in a chronic pain type cycle. 
So we're going to jump back to this alarm system that we're talking about, you know, the sensitive nervous system. And so we're just going to kind of read along on this uh, of our first uh, metaphor. So at your house, there's an alarm system that is there to monitor anything that might threaten your safety. How do we set off the alarm system? Uh, to set off the alarm system, someone must break a window, you know, kick in a door. Once the window is broken, the door is kicked in, the alarm goes off. The main job of the alarm is to warn you of the danger. When the alarm goes off and you wake up, what do you do? You likely call the cops who come and investigate. So once the cops come, see everything is all the well, the alarm system gets reset, it gets set back to normal, and then things calm down. Uh, you know, in case there's, so, because, you know, this is preparing us for, like, another break-in. It's a normal expectation that one danger has been assessed and eliminated. The alarm system will turn back down to its normal resting level. However, some people do not respond well to break-ins. The alarm woke them up. There's a lot of stress and uncertainty. You know, what set off the alarm? Who's going to come back? Is this going to happen more frequently? Are my insurance rates going to go up? So we kind of start going through that cycle, uh, catastrophizing about the alarm going off. You know, it's normal to worry if it's going to happen again. With the increased worry, it might seem normal to turn the alarm down, but not all the way. So you keep the alarm more sensitive. Thus, leaving the house with an extra sensitive alarm system, the new setting might indeed be more likely to activate if a window broke or a door kicked in, but it also might allow the alarm to go off for things that aren't an actual threat, like a leaf blowing by. Um, now, with that said, let's flip that to what does that have to do with you and your sensitive alarm system. So the nervous system is the exact same way. It constantly monitors for threats, you know, injuries, stepping on a nail, emotional, you know, chemical. This is normal and occurs in every person. When a threat comes along, the alarm is activated. Our alarm sends a message to the brain, which in turn makes us uh, care for the issue. So initially, you know, pain is a good response. Pain is there to tell you like, hey, you know, use this part of your body more uh, strategically or to tell you that, hey, you know, this one is, you know, a little bit more beyond. We need to kind of shut this one down right now. And, you know, the, that's my job to make those calls, you know, with like a disbulge patient that has loss of bowel and bladder, loss of motor control. You know, obviously that's a different line. That's where we're going to go ahead and get them out and refer to a specialist. You know, somebody with grade three, you know, sprain strains, uh, you know, something that's handled by thread. You know, those are things that we're going to get out. So, you know, pain does have its role and it, it starts out as a normal process and something that's good and healthy for us. So our alarm sends a message to the brain. And we're not going to get bogged down in this, but the brain will go into it next week. But the brain is ultimately what decides if the alarm signal becomes a danger or not. So remember, the pain is not from a receptor out in the tissue. The pain is when the brain decides it has an issue. And, you know, if this is challenging, you remember our example of, you know, phantom limb syndrome. You know, people who were amputated knee down, they still had pain in the part of the body that was gone. So it's ultimately the brain that decides whether a signal is pain or not. So this one, you know, for example, you step on a nail, the danger message is sent to the brain so you can take action. It's normal to protect us once the threat is eliminated, the alarm will gradually turn down and we can go on with our life. But what happens if the alarm stays slightly sensitive like we talked about in the house example? The alarm is triggered by an event such as an injury, surgery, emotional time in life, and remember, this is already pretty challenging right now to start tying this into emotional uh, because we haven't traditionally looked at emotional being a pain trigger. And I was talking to a patient today about how I can tell during my workout weeks if I'm in a high training volume and I have a lot of stress going on and I'm not eating good and I have a lot of responsibilities. I already know when I'm more likely to have a tweak that my nervous system picks up on because it's all interconnected tissue inflammation, it never comes down. As with the leaf example, an extra sensitive nervous system will significantly impact your ability to do things where you were able to do before. So this is the case in point of you've had an injury to your back, let's say three, four years ago, you got some treatment, you felt better, but now all of a sudden, two years later, you go to pick up a shoe and your back goes out. And you know, this is the common thing that we hear, you know, I'm, I, I threw my back out. 
So what happened there? It's that overly sensitive nervous system. It was still turned on and it didn't present a big major problem, but it's reached that tipping point with its sensitivity where now it won't shut off. And we'll get into how you know certain cases of pain, depending on how chronic and the complexity of it, will change how quickly it will respond from chiropractic, um, you know, pain management, and things like that. So it's really, really fascinating. And you know, this happens even when the tissue is healed. So why do human alarm systems stay extra sensitive? And you know, we talked about that with the yellow flags. Um, dealing with pain every day adds stress and can cause issues at home work. Treatments are not working, otherwise you would be here. Uh, you wouldn't be here. You've been given several different explanations for pain. So like all this uncertainty, all these things going on, this leads into those uh, yellow flags and keeps the chronic pain cycle going. As long as you're stressed, confused, afraid, etc., your alarm is likely to remain extra sensitive. So we already talked about that one. So guys, what can you do to calm down your sensitive alarm system and you probably already know what we're going to say it's going to be movement we talked about last week in the link showing you the functional MRIs of the patient um, who had been in pain for two years with certain movements uh, I believe it was with the back and then they shot the functional MRIs of them when they were actually going through the movements and you see the red lines on the uh, functional MRI brain scans but then you see the pain education science and then after the pain education science, you notice those red lines go down even though they're doing the same movements. So it's quite fascinating. The key is just what we've been trying to do. That's why we keep telling you, okay, we're up three minutes. So this week, you know, we're gonna have you up to four minutes. So you'll notice we're gradually trying to get you to move in a sore but safe way. Remember the activity guide never fives or sixes. We do it a little bit different. You know, I say one or two sore but safe, five or six, you know, shut it down. Um, one or two is if you're sore for an entire week, then let's back it off. But those are what we're trying to teach you and that's why. is because to calm down the sensitive alarm system, we have to start integrating movement back into our lives. And I know it's hard, but that's why I try to encourage you. Garden, walk with your dogs, walk with your kids. If you like riding a bike, ride a bike. If you like swimming, if you like running, you find the movement that works best for you that you feel sore and safe. So this is really tough for some people because, you know, we can see the functional MRIs and we can see the changes in the brain, but that's not exactly 100% an actual lasting change. So what do we mean by that is it takes time for your nervous system to change and rewire. And so that's something that we wanted to talk about is how long does it take to change? Now, you know, there's big fancy words with this called neuroplasticity. And we may end up writing a blog to kind of go deeper into this, but the honest answer is, is that we don't have it neatly defined. You know, even when we thought about like, how long does it take for us to form a habit with our nervous system? You know, it was thought to be 28 days, but they said, you know, on average it's actually closer to 68 days and it can be a wide scale. So this is no different. Um, and you know, the interesting thing here is we're gonna reference another book called A Brain That Changes Itself. This was one of the books that was instrumental to starting to change the way that I was thinking as a practitioner because I read this chapter on pain maps with, I'm gonna not say the name right, I'm sorry, Rem Churin. And it was very interesting. So he's most known for working on people with phantom limb syndrome and introducing the mirror therapy to it that was then picked up by Mosley. So, you know, these are all some of the giants that we stand on the shoulders of. But it was really fascinating because he actually has a quote in the brain that changes itself. Looking at, you know, patients who had been in pain longer, it was a lot um, harder for them to respond. So not to misquote, patients who had had the pain syndrome for only two months got better. The first day of the pain lessened and relief lasted even after a mirror session was over. And so remember, this was a phantom limb type person who had an amputation and they had pain in a limb that wasn't there anymore. He did mirror therapy on them and that's what he's seeing. After a month, they no longer had any pain. Patients who had the syndrome between five months and a year did not do quite as well, but they lost stiffness in their limbs and were able to go back to work. And so remember, this is what I was talking to you about. We can get our patients pretty functional pretty fast with all the advancements in soft tissue and you know even you know referrals and collaborations with pain management docs so we have ways to get people back to function but what's taking so long and why we're trying to put the ball on your court is because we need this gradual continual movement to change the nervous system those who had the pain for longer than two years failed to get better you know this isn't to discourage you 
but it's just to go to show you that in this instance, because they were using a mirror therapy, that the more complex and the longer the pain was, the less of a response that they had in it. And you know, this is different because you know what we're talking about is you know graded and gradual movement, and you know we have all the systemic reviews for pain neuroscience education, returning people back. And you know what a systemic review is, is basically means it's our highest level of research because it's pulling what we call randomized controlled trials. Um, so, you know, comparison studies looking at this treatment versus another. And they pull a bunch of those to find the studies. So, you know, don't lose hope at what that's saying. But it's here to actually encourage you to know that, okay, you may not get this done by the time we finish all 14, 16 modules, however many we expand this out to be. And I know that's like that's 16 weeks, but this is about gradual movement. Focus on what's happening right now, your return to function, the things that you can do in your life. Can you hold your daughter that you love more? Can you go golf again? You know, Focus on the things that are happening now. And then gradually, let's see where it goes. And that's what we've been saying from the beginning. Okay, so we're going to do homework. So we're going to go to four minutes now. This is what we're talking about, that gradual increase. Can you do three to five days this time? And so remember, this is going to be case by case. And if you're struggling with like, well, how many days can I really do? Uh, reach out to us, Facebook, Instagram, text our clinic. Let us know. We'll tell you what you need to do. We're very common with this. We're both runners, big runner background. So we can kind of program what you need to do. But let's see. Can you move for four minutes, three days, maybe four days, maybe even five? And you know, use that guide on the activity guide. And also remember, you know, if you're sore but safe, that's okay. But if you're sore but safe for an entire week after this, then we may want to bring it back down a day or you know, maybe bring it down a minute, you know, things of that nature. So something else that we wanted to talk about, this is kind of looking at the whole person. So, you know, just talking about movement and not looking at other strategies would would be a flaw in my system. So we want to also talk about sleep hygiene. So we've actually posted our blog on it. So some of the things that you can get from sleep, you know, get sick less often, stay at a healthy weight, so, you know, boosting the immune system, uh, metabolism, lowering your risk for health problems, diabetes, heart disease, reduce stress and increase your mood, think more clearly and do better in school and at work and get along better with people. So, you know, these are some of the things that you can look at sleep. And you remember sleep is your body's way of recovering as well. So we need that good sleep. Take stress down in your life. And, you know, if you're in chronic pain, getting sleep is probably pretty hard. So we wanted to give you strategies to work around that. We always say if we can get a patient who's having trouble to sleep, the getting back to sleep, that's one of the biggest things that we can do in life, especially like in fibromyalgia or chronic pain type patients. Um, I want to thank you for coming along on this journey with us. Next week we'll be talking more about the brain and the output. Um, we're really excited what this resource will do to empower you. We want you to use it as a springboard. We're really just trying to put the ball in your court so you can get moving and see what all you can get done. And then we're always here for you if you get stuck. Guys, I'm so proud of where you're at and where you're doing you know, one step at a time, baby steps. Don't get overwhelmed, but if you need us, we're always here for you. All right, guys, thank you.